Well, thanks again, uh, Helge, for uh, for uh, taking us through that last session. Um, and th thanks to, I guess, all of the speakers that we've had uh, with us uh, up until this point. Um, it's been great to, to see um, tours of so many labs without uh, having to leave my bedroom and uh, to, uh, to hear a couple of in-depth talks um, ranging from uh, the profoundly mathematical Bayesian uh, statistics to the uh, um, much more uh, tangible and applied um, geometry processing with a, a latent hunger for Bayesian statistics. So um, now we're uh, we're ready for our, our last kind of formal event, uh, which is a panel. Um, our title for the panel is uh, Beyond the Ivory Tower, Deepening Our External Connections. And, um, you know, the whole event is um, a Teda open house. Our goal is to kind of open the doors of Teda and show uh, both the um, the, the technical and methodological depth of our membership and, and of the, the work happening at UBC around AIML, and also the, the disciplinary and intellectual breadth of our members, um, you know, across the, the many different uh, departments and faculties that, that make up data. Um, so, so this is, uh, you know, the tone in which we'd like to uh, have this panel. Uh, our goal here is to um, focus um, a, a little bit outwardly, you know, this is still a, uh, an event where we're, we're this is our, our open house so we're not we're not bringing in people from outside UBC to participate in, in the event we had our industry day six months ago that was much more about that so this is um, people you know inside UBC sort of focusing on their experiences looking out and uh, kind of having a conversation about uh, what works what doesn't and how we can take the the work that's happening here at UBC and really make it uh, uh, impactful in, in our community and our world um, so we have a, a an exciting and uh, um, a really accomplished panel to to join us today to help us uh, think about these questions. So I'm going to um, quickly introduce them. Uh, it's always a, a danger when introducing a, an accomplished group like this that uh, if you go down the rabbit hole of listing everybody's accomplishments, you don't get any time for the panel. So I'll uh, I'll try to keep it at a high level. Um, so I'll. Uh, Try to go in alphabetical order here. Um, so uh, Jeff Kloon is uh, uh, has just recently joined us at UBC. We're really happy to have him. Uh, he's um, still, I think, has a, a, a concurrent position as a research team leader at OpenAI, which is one of the really exciting places where AI research is happening uh, internationally today. Um, he was previously a senior research manager uh, at Uber AI Labs, um, and. Uh, before that was a professor in computer science at the University of Wyoming. Um, he works in uh, um, machine learning, kind of intersecting with deep learning, um, evolving neural networks and robotics. And he has, a, as everyone does, has a, a bevy of awards, um, notably including um, uh, various uh, outstanding publication, best paper award kinds of uh, awards, a presidential early career award, and an invitation to a White House AI summit. So um, great to have you, Jeff. Um, secondly, let me introduce uh, Christina Canadi, uh, who's a professor of computer science uh, who specializes in artificial intelligence and human computer interaction. Um, she, uh, her research has received awards from a, a wide variety of venues uh, including um, UMUAI, the Journal of User Modeling and User Adapted Interaction, the International Conference on Intelligent User Interfaces, the International Conference on User, user Modeling, Adaptation and Personalization, uh, and on and on. Um, notably, she served as the president of the Association for the Advancement of Effective Computing and uh, has served as a program or conference chair for uh, a surprisingly wide variety of international conferences. So if you have an international conference and you'd like somebody to agree to be the program or general <laughs> chair. Don't uh, ask me. <laughs> it's an excellent choice. Uh, if you're learning from Dana, you can see that she's likely to say yes <laughs> and probably to do a good job. Um, so, you would pay uh, for uh, this. <laughs> you find the chair. Um, so, uh, Third, uh, Karen McLean is uh, a professor of computer science uh, and also a, a, a special advisor to the Dean of Science on knowledge mobilization, uh, which I mentioned because it's particularly relevant to the topic of this panel. Um, her mandate there is uh, helping to advise on the design and implementation of science's knowledge translation and innovation strategy 
assessing ways to increase science participation in UBC's innovation pathways. Um, but of course, um, she uh, is first and foremost an academic, uh, I think, uh, you can see what she has to say. Um, her, uh, her research is, is focused on restoring physicality to computer interaction um, and uh, focuses particularly on haptic, which is to say um, patch-oriented um, modalities in human-computer interaction um, with, with many applications to uh, deployment of human um, uh, of computer systems in, in human context. Uh, her background mixes mechatronics, robotics, physiology, and sensory psychophysics. Uh, and her work has uh, gone through all of these fields um, and uh, has uh, a touch practice in a lot of different ways. Um, she, uh, like everybody, has a, a daunting list of awards, including best papers at, uh, at pop venues like I, the Haptics Symposium. Uh, she received the uh, Charles McDowell Award at UBC, um, uh, a, a Killam Faculty Research Fellowship, and on and on. So. Um, thanks uh, for being with us today, Karen. Um, I, I hate to say last but not least, because it always suggests that somebody else must be least, so I'll just say last, uh, is uh, Robert Rowling, um, who's a, a professor with a joint appointment in electrical and computer engineering, and also in mechanical engineering. Uh, one kind of engineering wasn't enough to contain Rob Rowling. Um, he's, uh, but that's not enough for him. He's also the director of uh, the Institute for Computing, Information, and Cognitive Systems, which is Ada's own parent organization. So you can see that this is uh, you know, a shameless uh, attempt by the, the leadership of Ada to ingratiate ourselves with our, with our uh, supervisor by having him here on this panel. Um, you know, just kidding. But uh, and Rob Rowling's research is at the interface of biomedical engineering with uh, specialization in medical ultrasound. We already heard a bit about some of the exciting ultrasound work that's being done uh, in Parang's uh, lab for earlier. Um, and uh, Rob um, notably has received awards for his teaching, for his research, and for his service. So he's uh, got the, the whole award trifecta going on. Um, again, a, a wide range of uh, best paper awards, Young Scientists Awards, which you, know, you can see from, from his video, he must have gotten just days ago uh, and, uh, and on and on. So uh, I'll leave it there and uh, uh, let's all um, virtually clap our hands and thank this panel for, uh, for coming here into the firing line and, uh, and being willing to, to engage with all of us. So I'd like to begin by um, asking a question that kind of focuses um, a bit squarely on um, AI, which is of course the reason why we're all here. So I'd like to invite each of you, um, maybe in the order in which I introduced you, uh, to reflect on recent breakthroughs in the field of AI, um, broadly construed, uh, which in your opinion are ripe for greater uptake by external organizations. And uh, throughout this panel, let's understand external organizations as including industry, government, and nonprofit really, um, you know, non-academic partners that we might work with uh, as academics. So, uh, Jeff, uh, would you like to begin? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> so I think that, you know, somebody asked me kind of what is the technology that you think is going to most continue to impact and disrupt industry and provide opportunity? I think the answer, the easy answer is deep learning. And we all know that deep learning is powerful. So why am I saying that, even though that's kind of a known answer? I think it's because we're just getting warmed up and I think people, despite all the hype, are not yet appreciating the impact that this technology will have and how much more is coming down the pipe. Uh, and I, you know, basically a lot of the academic successes have been followed by deployment in industry, but anyone who's tried to do that has learned that that's harder than, than it seems. And so partly there's a lot of work to get the transfer right. So that's one reason why we'll continue to see increased deployment because we'll get better at the transfer. Second, the algorithms themselves are getting better. There's literally an army of people, as we speak right now at the iClear conference, but at many other conferences, the number of papers, the number of people in the field has just gone up exponentially. And so the number of algorithmic advances continue to go up. Um, and so we'll have new innovations. That's the second reason why we'll continue to see kind of flow from deep learning in industry and it having bigger and bigger effect. And I also think there's a third phenomenon, which is that deep learning continues to kind of eat and disrupt AI itself and the sciences itself. And so as it kind of pushes into more and more areas, that's like a new place where we'll see transfer out of deep learning. So I wouldn't sleep on deep learning as like something that we should say, oh, now like, let's focus on what's next. I would say 
you know, where hasn't it been, de where hasn't deep learning been applied yet? And if somebody goes and applies it there, so far that has been a formula for success that I have seen over and over and over again. That applies within academic disciplines as well as in within industry. Specifically, though, I'll take the bait a little bit more on like what very recent developments are um, going to be monumentally disruptive. And I will say another relatively obvious answer, but maybe it's not as obvious for some of the people that um, aren't in academia that are in industry, and that is GPT-3 style large language models. So just um, basically, if you're not familiar with that, then the idea is you take a ridiculously large neural net. I'm talking on the orders of hundreds of billions of parameters. Soon, I think we'll very clearly see trillions of parameter networks. And their job is to read the entire internet, for example, read all of archive, all of bio archive, all of the scientific papers that have ever been written, all of the books that have ever been written, read Reddit, you know, and start to um, be able to predict a new text when given a chunk of text. So if you read half an article, can you basically try to write the rest of the article? Now, that seems like kind of a silly thing to train a neural net to do. And this is the thing that I would encourage people to try to invest time in if you're looking for opportunities for new applications of technology. There is amazing, there's an amazing amount of things that you can pull out of a network that has learned to, to kind of fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks, or predict the next thing based on the previous thing. For example, some of the mind blowing things that come out of things like GPT-3 is that if you uh, give it an entire article and then at the end you say, you know, which in summary says, or TLDR, or, you know, an executive summary of this article is, well, its job is to fill in the blank there. And so it will give you a summary of that article. Or if you give it an entire article, you can then say, you know, which in French translates to, and now you have a translation engine. Um, or you could give it all of Harry Potter and then ask it questions about Harry Potter. And if you phrase the question in like the way that somebody might have asked and answered that question in articles on the internet, then you will get answers out of it. And so people are just uh, like off to the races. There's you know hedge funds that are specifically only funding companies that are investing in things like GPT-3. There's new use cases coming out on Twitter by the minute. People are using it to um, program, for example. So you know you type in like a comment of a code, like this is a method that does X, and it's a pretty complicated thing. And boom, it'll just spit out an entire uh, chunk of code that's, that performs that task. People are now using it in bioinformatics. There's a recent paper out of Rob Fergus's group and Facebook AI research, which is really wonderful, where they did the exact same idea, but they did it on bioinformatics sequences. So they just give it genomic sequences endlessly. And then it knows how to like predict future genomic sequences from previous, you know, from half a genome, it can give you the rest of the genome, which means it can invent new proteins that you maybe didn't exist in biology. Maybe you can try to predict and invent what kinds of targets should be in, a, um, you know, for drugs or um, what a novel virus might look like after it mutates, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole list in that paper. So I think it's worth spending time trying to think, you know, first of all, just wrap your head around how are people getting information out of these systems and where are people applying them and what have people not yet decided to apply them to? And there's just the sky is the limit for this technology. And it's not just applying it to text, but think about what other modalities are there lots of data where you could train these models to go extract. Basically, this is the, the, the dream of unsupervised learning that you can just take a lot of data, learn a lot from it and then get a lot out of it. And so if I was looking for a, like a new startup uh, to start today, I would probably be thinking about GPT-3 style training and what I could get out of it for free. Thank you for an articulate and passionate answer, Jeff. Uh, let's uh, let's move to Christina. You're muted. I said that you're a hard one to follow. So, uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, I want to follow. And you know, I I agree that there is still uh, great potential for deep learning techniques that hasn't been exploited, and there is going to be very exciting um, things to come. Um, but um, I, I see that one reason why um, they might not have been adopted as widely as uh, the results might suggest is possibly because there is this. Um, black box nature to them. So the interpretability of these models is still limited. So one field of research, I mean, I cannot say it's a breakthrough yet because there's still uh, research that it's quite um, novel, but it's really how to, to allow um, users and uh, developers of deep learning models to uh, get a better sense of uh, why these models work so well, um, when they do, what are the limitations, how to fix them. 
So I think there is um, a lot of uh, interest and research on uh, techniques for uh, increasing explainability and interpretability of uh, deep learning models that um, I think would uh, certainly, you know, as these techniques become more um, solid um, and effective, they will uh, really make a big difference in how willing people will be or companies or um, different parties will be to um, use and adopt these technologies. Because I think there is still a reluctance, especially in some fields, including, for instance, health and education, when there is, you know, there are higher stakes in the decisions and predictions that are made where uh, the lack of interpretability is, is a concern. And, uh, and so moving in that direction, I think is going to be, you know, making a difference. Um, and the second point is that what I find very exciting is that again, you know, data is, is awesome and, and can give us a lot, uh, but I still believe that in the end, the greatest accomplishments will uh, happen when we'll bring data and knowledge together the way humans do, right? So I think there is also a lot of uh, interest in exploring techniques that, bring deep learning and data-driven approaches back together with more knowledge-based and expert-based approaches where you can sort of like drive the learning process or inform the learning process using existing knowledge and, uh, and criteria and um, information that we already have on many of the tasks on which the, this uh, data-driven technique could be applied. So, um, and that would, you know, because I mean, there is, of course, amazing results from deep learning, and there are also well-known limitations, which explain why they maybe haven't moved. Um, there, there is great accomplishment in uh, um, speech, um, image uh, processing, uh, text processing. Um, but again, for instance, there are results on uh, more general natural language processing um, or semantic based dialogue are still limited. And I feel that there can be a lot of progress that can be made there by bringing together the data and the knowledge based approaches. That's it. Thanks, Christina. Uh, let's move on to Karen. So, uh... Thank you. And uh, building on what both Jeff and Christina have said, I'll take it a little deeper into the human end of things. Uh, I'm not exactly an AI person, but part of what my research does is it, it draws heavily on AI techniques in order there's draw, drag information out of sensors and out of environments to incorporate into user interactions of a, a many different kinds. And if we think about the reasons uh, to the extent that machine learning and AI techniques have not been as adopted as they might or what's what's bottling that up some of it is the end use and being able to actually deliver the information for example CADA is about supporting decision making and people in the end are making those decisions and the information actually needs to support them so part of it is interpretability like Christina has said but there's another part is actually what are the decisions that people need to make and how do they need the information presented to them and how can it actually be useful for them and a lot of times what, what it will turn out to be is they need different algorithms in order to support the actual decisions that they actually need to make or the way they need to work. And uh, so I would, as we're looking at uptake, I think it's very important to go out into the places where people are actually going to be using this technology and understand how it is actually gonna have the direct impact on applications and on people and, and make the full loop so that you're actually driving some of those research questions back into industry, into academia and saying, these are, these are the problems you need to solve because this isn't actually getting handled yet. I work at the interface of health technology, for example, with, with many clinicians and uh, many, many, many people there will say, you know, there's all these algorithms that are supposed to be able to do all this stuff with data and I would like to be able to access, but I can't use it. It's not getting to me. There's these huge blockages for this technology to actually support my work. And so, uh, I think that along with all the great innovations that, for example, Jeff was talking about, I think we also have to talk about what are bottlenecks down the road and really tighten those collaborations and that convection that, that makes innovation happen. Thanks, uh, Rob, uh, over to you. Yep, yeah, and thanks. Uh, I'm gonna first add a 
a quick thanks to the uh, organizers and the speakers and the audience for a really fantastic uh, event. It's been uh, really a pleasure to be a part of this. Um, so to answer the question about uptake in external organizations, um, we know we didn't prepare this ahead of time, but frankly, explainable uh, AI was the top thing that came to my mind as well too. So similar to what you've heard before, you know, I'm in the, the health space. So these are critical, you know, high stakes decisions that are being made. So explainability of this uh, is, is paramount is what I'm hearing from a number of external organizations. Um, in fact, on an earlier call today uh, with Creative Destruction Lab, there was a, a comment made, this is a, a accelerator for uh, startups, that frankly, everyone and their dog now has an AI algorithm for interpreting x-ray images and COVID hasn't necessarily helped that. Uh, there's, there's a number of solutions out there, but often trained on small data sets, um, not necessarily balanced. Um, and even uh, the regulators have pushed through. I think it's fair to say the FDA has approved products that uh, are also sharing some of these limitations as well, just in order to, to find solutions in the marketplace for some of the pressing needs. So um, this is what I'm also doing. Um, you've heard from Prang Alba Masumi. Uh, he's leading obviously the project on ultrasound at the point of care, which has really grown a lot, uh, especially during COVID as well. But again, there, the same challenges arise where um, even though we may have really large data sets, the, the labeling may be small in that as well too. And not only that the labeling may be small, the labeling may have errors in it. So actually extending the AI to not just, you know, training on, on the data you believe you're trusted, but using it in order to select good balanced data sets, using it to fix errors, uh, has to be extended further and earlier into the, the pipeline of that as well too. So. I guess to, to wrap up, it feels in my field, medical imaging, we're a little bit in the, the trough of despair with, with AI techniques where there was initial excitement, but now there's a fair bit of skepticism. So we need to win over the clinicians again, because we need to provide them with solutions they can trust and uh, are explainable uh, and, and demonstrate and prove that we've got balance in, in our data sets that are used to train them. So, so it's always a dangerous Thing to uh, to see a panel starting to uh, to move too much towards uh, uh, consensus on any point. So so let me uh, stop to kind of reflect on this this point about explainability that that uh, a majority of you have started to, to latch onto, and maybe Jeff would have too if you had the chance. Um, I I wonder really where where this is coming from. I mean I I think it's obviously a sort of popular and appealing thing to say that we should prefer you know models that are explainable to ones that aren't, but Seems that human expertise is often uh, a lot less explainable than we um, might like to believe. Um, you know, solutions that we um, widely use often lack explanations. You know, as far as I understand, you know, we don't we don't understand why general anesthetics work in a deep way. You know, there, there are a lot of things that are just widely deployed that, that lack satisfying explanations. And you know, maybe a lot of the time, what we really care about is proven track records and kind of understood failure modes. And so, I guess I wonder whether you, you really think that, you know, maybe if you could reflect a little bit more on what you mean when you say that explainability is important and, you know, the extent to which you believe that explainability uh, is a sort of way of solving poor performance or if it's really required in a way that's entirely orthogonal to performance. Uh, I'm happy to take a first crack at that. The, um, the answer is, of course, both, right, <laughs> to that. So, one is performance, you know, when algorithms are trained and uh, papers are published with certain performance, but in, in real life, often the, when you're trying on patients, you have, uh, frankly, out of distribution errors. So when you have subjects that are really not in the distribution and you're getting poor performance, so it's not actually meeting performance requirements. But the second part is the keeping the, the operator in the loop, right? How do they actually add their knowledge to the results that are coming out of this? Uh, so instead of simply overriding it, how do you actually combine that uh, user expertise with the AI results? That's an ongoing challenge. Somebody else like to jump in? Yeah, Jeff, well, you haven't spoken for a while. What do you have to say? 
Yeah, so I spent, you know, probably six, seven years of my career focused on trying to understand how neural nets work and what they do. And I find it fascinating in the same way that a neuroscientist finds brains fascinating. We want to understand how they work because they're impressive. But I've actually come away from that work much more depressed about the hopes for um, keeping up with the complexity of neural nets. It just takes a long time to try to understand how they work. And even then, the, the explanation is rather partial. Uh, and you're not quite sure that you that you got what you were hoping for. Uh, and so I think, as Kevin suggested, what's really going to happen is it's going to go the route of humans. You know, first of all, performance is going to dominate. If you can make a thing that works really, really, really well, people would prefer an explanation, but if they don't have one, they'll use it anyway. And second of all, you know, human doctors will explain things to us or why they did X or Y, or, you know, so will drivers and so will parents. But really, is that the real explanation for what they did? One of my favorite experiments in the history of science is somebody took people and they asked them, you know, like, which art, which painting do you want to take home with you today? You know, A or B? And then they'll pick A and then they'll say, okay, now why did you choose? And they'll point it and they'll swap it on like the screen and they'll, you know, so people will end up giving you an explanation for why they chose the painting that they didn't choose. And they're long, lengthy, very convincing explanations for the thing that they didn't do. Uh, which means, in my opinion, we're very good at providing explanations that feel good for us, but maybe aren't actually truly the explanations under the hood. And I think ultimately, maybe neural nets will go that way. Uh, you'd ask GPT-3 or GPT-10, you know, why did you do this? And it'll provide a very convincing explanation, which may or may not be the real reason that it, that it gave us the thing. But if it works well, we'll take it. And so, you know, I think for some classical types of AI, we really want these explanations and we are therefore constrained to that kind of AI. But for the kind of AI that I'm suggesting is coming, like really powerful, big, deep neural nets, we're going to be in the same situation as a human where like, you know, Kevin's 10 trillion connection brain can give me an explanation that I find convincing or maybe not. But since I know he's really good at his job, I'll trust his advice. Christina, you look skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, you know what, I want to follow up on your question where, you know, do we get this sense that interpretability and explainability can be useful. So um, on the, and I want to make a distinction between interpretability and explainability, at least how I see it. Interpretability is more connected to um, the technical aspects of the models working and just more of interest for model developers and expert users, whereas explainability is often seen what, you know, Karen was referring to for end users that might not have uh, really any interest in changing the model or in uh, working with the model, but they just need to make decisions based on the model's outcomes. And I've, have, I've had direct uh, experience where um, both concepts are in fact uh, relevant. For instance, I got a large um, grant from Huawei because they have some deep learning models to solve some issues with their video and uh, photo um, um, techniques for their uh, devices. And uh, they just don't understand why they work when they work and what to do to improve them. And they're really, really interested in uh, understanding more about these models and they are willing to engage in collaborations and put you know, a lot of effort, uh, financial and also um, man hours to, for that. So there is definitely that, that need. Um, and, um, and then from the explainability and for end users, um, we have done, there is, you know, substantial research showing that um, there are applications, especially in situations where there is, uh, you know, higher things at stake, education and health, where um, different users uh, appreciate or not having explanations. So I totally agree that not everybody needs an explanation, not everybody would seek an explanation, and even the same person under different circumstances might uh, want or not um, to get better insights on how the model reached uh, their outcome. But um, it's true that for some users, uh, explanations are important and they change their perception of, uh, of the model, of the technology and their willingness to accept it. So I won't go into the details, but um, I think it's a really fascinating, I mean, I, I, it's not binary. Explanations are good or explanations are not good. It's a big range. And I think there is a lot of, there is a lot of also like philosophical questions on Again, what explanations are when, when they're useful and what to do with explanations that are not truthful. 
right? Jeff made a great point where explanations can be used to, you know, you just, as long as it's convincing, maybe it's not absolutely, it's not the way the, the model worked, but um, makes the person happy. Is that a good thing or not? This is, these are all open questions. Um, and uh, I'm personally very interested in exploring the space uh, rather than say, well, maybe, you know, we don't need AI to explain because we have humans that can do it. I'm interested to see how we can push the boundaries and, uh, you know, uh, a little bit, you know, in between the yes or no, what are the different uh, nuances and the different um, degrees at which explanation and interpretability can be useful. I just wanted to jump in and add, uh, I, I agree with a lot that's been said, but I think there's a couple things that have not been covered, which are really important. And one is the power and the trust that is being placed in such algorithms and the damage that they can do, which go far beyond what uh, a lot of individual human uh, decisions are able to do. And also any, it's true of any kind of automation where you completely take a human out of the loop and place an algorithm in power there. And, and, and there's not a person somewhere in the process which is saying, hey, that doesn't make any sense. That's not right. That's, that, that, was, that was like, that was a total bogey. Um, hit the button, stop it, this is wrong. If you remove that, there's no catch point. We're putting total trust in the algorithm and terrible things can happen. And, and there's just no common sense break in the system when they're deployed with real people and real problems. And we're seeing so much evidence of that kind of thing happening right now. So I, I think that some of this is simply that the consequences are, are severe. And I will also throw out the challenge is that why shouldn't it be better than humans in at least some ways? Why, why are we limiting ourselves to the standard of what humans can do? Humans are very fallible and anyone who studies them much are, are uh, Jeff's, there's lots of examples like the one that Jeff came gave, but that doesn't mean that uh, we're, we're looking at humans to do better than that, at machines to do better than that. If I, I mean, if I could just say one thing quickly, because that's such an important point, I want to make sure that I'm not just coming across as a cheerleader for this technology. I totally agree, Karen, with everything you said about the danger that can be caused by these algorithms. But I actually think on the point of explainability, there can be a halo effect that could also be dangerous, which is that we think we're getting an explanation, which is not the true explanation. For example, if a sentencing software produced by a company has to provide an explanation, I guarantee you there's going to be an, an incentive for that company to make explanations that, that have the AI say it's not using race or, or gender or whatever, when maybe it is under the hood. And so we should understand that just like a human, the explanations can be fallible and are, won't be perfect. We would love them to be and we should make we should try to make them superhuman. But, uh, you know, we should keep skepticism around and not just kind of like take the, the mental junk food and assume oh, that gave us what we want and move on and assume that that's the real explanation for the, what's happening under the hood. It was a really fascinating conversation. I like how we started with explanation and uh, we, we seem to have really brought in kind of a concern about transfer learning and sort of see sort of explanation as a guardrail for transfer learning, uh, you know, for, for the poor generalization to the scenarios that, that a model wasn't trained on. Um, and, and I also like how uh, towards the end there, we, we brought in a kind of game theoretic perspective where we started thinking about the incentives uh, that were present to the people who might have designed a system and how um, you know explanation can can either sort of further or or help to kind of guard against some of those incentives. Um, I'd like to, to change gears a little bit and uh, speak a little bit more explicitly about uh, external partnerships. Um, so I'd like to invite um, each of you, uh, maybe just in whatever order you you choose to go, uh, to reflect, if you can, on an example of a university external partnership, uh, either from your own experience or uh, from, from that of a colleague that you observed uh, closely um, that you think worked particularly well. And I guess I'd be interested in, in reflecting on what you think contributed to the success of the partnership, um, what the potential failure modes you think might have kind of almost happened and how they were avoided, and uh, you know, what lessons can be learned from this um, you know, by others wanting to apply AI technologies uh, you know, beyond the university. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in first and so I can grab the low hanging fruit and leave everyone else trying to <laughs> jumping. So I'll, I'll say that I just I'll, I'll say one thing which I think is, is super important. I've had lots of uh, collaborations with with industry partners and some of them have been awesome and some of them have have not been awesome. And, uh, and probably for either side. And I think the single thing that I, I look at when I'm, when I'm trying to embark on something that is going to be the biggest predictor of whether it's going to go well or not go well is uh, do both sides 
have realistic and compatible things that they want to get out of the partnership? And are you able to speak really clearly about that? What you can do in academia and what is interesting and valuable for you to do in academia is very different from what is interesting and valuable and necessary when you're in industry. And so both sides need to accommodate the others and be able to really grasp what is in it for the other side and for that to be good for both of you. So I think my, <laughs> this is kind of sad, but my very best collaboration ever was my very first one. It was a long time ago. And it was with Nissan, a Japanese company. And what was really amazing about them, they were old hands at this. I was new at it. So, so I learned from them was that they said, um, this is what we're good at. This is what we want from you. We want you to think about 10, 20 years out. We want you to work on the stuff that we can't do. Even in our big research lab, they have big well-funded research, lots of facilities. We want you to think about the crazy stuff that is even going beyond what we can do. And it's gonna be so far out in the head that we don't even care if you publish it. Just tell us first and we'll understand what it's good for. And we'll give you the funding and whatever you need to do that. And we just want you to talk to us about what you're learning. And and so we had, and then I could look at their stuff and be inspired by the problems they were having. And they were very ambitious and had lots of great ideas themselves. And it was really, really fun and useful for both of us. And the project got cut short because they actually decided to commercialize the stuff that we did sooner than they had planned to. And I've always been trying to recreate that dynamic. So I think it's, uh, whereas others, um, I, I know that especially in this area and uh, um, AI and machine learning, that you're often getting people who want, in, want to use you as a kind of a use researchers as a as a kind of their own r d development and do something very short time frames and that's not going to be very compatible most of the time it might be good experience for some students to, to cut their teeth on it but it's probably not going to be very aligned with the research objectives here and so there's something that really both sides need to understand well, what kind of relationship um, is it do you want a student to work on a project or are you looking farther out and what is it what is going to be valuable for both of you so to, thanks, Karen. I mean, to, to follow up on what you just said, I guess you know you described this sort of Nissan partnership. It sounds sort of like the uh, the researcher's perspective of the partnership Holy Grail. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what the what, what you think um, led to you know establishing a partnership on those terms, and you know why have you had trouble you know recapturing the magic since you know even having had that positive experience. I, I think this company was very enlightened and they also had, it was a, it was a company that valued research. It had, was full of PhDs, so they understood what research was. And they had also had a great track record of success with their collaborative partners. And I'll say one other thing that I didn't mention. One of the reasons Nissan really was excited and what they wanted to put together is they wanted to work with teams of people. So they what, one of the things they saw as being very valuable in academia that they had a hard time achieving internally was a multidisciplinary multi, multi group of people who would look at a problem. They put up a problem that has very long-term ambitious implications and say, can you find two or three collaborators from these and these and these areas who will take really broad-based look at this thing, the 10 year out at least vision and kind of collaborate on that and then tell us what you find. And that's what they were really looking for. And, and they found that a team of us like that at UBC. And so they dumped a huge amount of money on us to do that. And they couldn't find that kind of collaboration. We lured them away from MIT where they could only find solo researchers and they wanted a team. So this was critical for them. Now that was um, a deep pockets company, which had the luxury of being able to look 10 or 15 years out. And I think one of the reasons it's been very hard to recreate that is that a lot of times we're working at very fast moving technology and companies who really don't have those long timelines. They're looking at the next one year max until they get bought or go under as a startup. And they, they, they can't look at those longer timelines and those are much more challenging. I'm very interested to what, I, I've struggled with that myself and I'm very interested in what the other panelists uh, say about collaborating with these much shorter timeline, smaller organizations. Thanks, I'm oh, I'm let's hear from oh. another panelist. Yeah, go, go for it, Christina. Yeah, so I, I completely agree, Karen, with your point that it's really important that there is a clear understanding of the objective of, of the two parties. Um, and uh, But I also think that it's important to have the right uh, kind of funding to possibly support these collaborations when you don't have this deep pocket uh, industrial partners. So for instance, I had um, what was called strategic grant um, that doesn't exist anymore, but essentially was all based on uh, 
NSERP just wanted to see that the company had a real interest in, in that in the specific project. And that was not uh, by putting money into the project, but by really showing that they wanted to put people's time. Uh, but there was no requirement to have any financial contribution uh, from the industrial partner end. And uh, for one particular data point that I have, we had a collaboration that was really excellent because I guess the company could afford to give us people's time for um, some of their collaborators that were more related to the scope of the project. They did not have money to, to put into that, but it was a very successful collaboration that was very similar to what you mentioned, where the company was interested in really sort of, uh, not blue sky completely, but definitely um, innovative things that they wouldn't have been able to uh, to explore or to address just, uh, you know, if they didn't have this, uh, this particular type of partnership. So, and I guess that kind of uh, funding source now doesn't exist anymore because I think the, the current alliance grants don't have that, you know, no commitment, financial commitment from companies. So I don't know. Um, that's sad. But then the other point is that you are asking about short term, you know, working with companies that have, uh, you know, short term, that have to have short term returns. And just now I'm engaged with a, a small startup. At the beginning, there were three people. Okay, now I think there are five or six, but um, and they um, essentially they have designed a platform to help kids acquire computational skills, computational thinking skills by uh, uh, programming electronic games. So they actually organize uh, um, classes where they get kids to participate. These are usually summer camps or extracurricular activity, after school activities. Um, and they were really interested in uh, seeing if they could have some form of intelligent agents within this framework that could uh, detect when the students were having issues working with or designing the game or grasping specific concepts. Because for an instructor in the classroom, it's hard to follow 15 students and provide timely help for each of them. So they were really, uh, they read some of my work on this intelligent pedagogical agents and they approached me. And um, I think we've made more progress with them in the last year. We, you know, I think we started collaborating a year and a half ago and we already have some of these intelligent agents that are tested in the classroom with real kids. Uh, in, you know, without changing anything in, in their setup and their, you know, we're looking now for, this is a MITAC sponsored collaboration for now, but we are applying for Alliance. And I really hope that um, that will continue because for me has been incredibly surprising because again, they're very small company. They don't have big budget at all. They do need to have, you know, quick returns and, but they're very committed and they believe in, in, in this technology. So they, you know, they decided to bet on it. And um, so far it's been working incredibly well. Thanks so much, Christina. Uh, let's go to Rob. Um, so this this question, I love this question. Frankly, it feels like this is my life right now. It's trying to answer this question. And I'll bring up one example, which is- You're our... not on the panel for no reason, Rob. <laughs> the, um, and, and thanking, uh, Karen, who's on the steering committee of this, and Ian Begg, I see, is on the call today from VPRI. But the, the relationship that we've developed with Rogers over 5G research, and it includes an AI component in, in many of the projects, has, has really been uh, a fascinating uh, journey um, because we, we eventually ended up what we developed, uh, we called the foundry model for, for working with industry. And it's a little bit different than just a, a fund and forget. And, and I actually wrote down a quote you said, Karen, which was inspired by their problems when you were talking about working with Nissan. And that's really the essence of it, where uh, universities are great for really tackling the blue sky out of the box type thinking, right? But being inspired by what their stakeholders are bringing as their big needs and big problems is really the key and then forming these multidisciplinary groups. And I had a lot of fun, honestly, when we did that with the Rogers projects, where we brought in people from around campus, different disciplines, people who never worked together before. Uh, and we had these, you know, post-it note type brainstorming sessions done electronically. And there is this self-assembly of teams. And then there is some initial proposals, feedback from the sponsor, modification of proposals, 
And Thomas settled on something that was actually satisfactory for both sides. So that's something that we're going to be expanding going forward. Um, and if there's another theme I want to draw people's attention to that's uh, growing, and that's the, the High Bar Initiative. So it uh, stands for Highly Integrated Basic and Responsive Research. And, and Lauren Whitehead out of physics at UBC has really uh, spearheaded this, but it's now in fact a consortium of I think 13 or more universities around North America. And this has a very similar uh, theme to it, which is how do you bring together people who are really doing the basic research with people who are doing more applied and the stakeholders and bring them together. And I think this is a trend we're going to see as you know, Christina also pointed out, the funding agencies are changing their, their types of funding. So we're gonna see more of this industry sponsored work or other, not just industry, other external stakeholders coming in uh, and, and working with UBC and trying to break through our silos a little bit to, to come up with good solutions. Thanks, Rob. Um, last word on this question to you, Jeff. Yeah, so I've been on both sides of this exchange, both um, in industry and academia. And so um, I think that Karen and Christina are exactly right in that both sides have to get what they want for it to be a really um, effective partnership. Uh, I think they fizzle out a lot if one side is really not happy with the arrangement. Um, and so I've seen a couple of different models work. Um, I like uh, what Rob just said in terms of fund it and forget it. That is one model. I consider that the Patreon model. Uh, when I was at Uber, I funded work at Berkeley um, because I liked the lab and I want, we, you know, we generally wanted something to be done in this space. There was an open problem that we had. We didn't have enough people to throw at it. And we knew that there was somebody really good, Sergey Levin over there. And, um, and we wanted a relationship with the lab. We wanted to set up recruiting pipelines. We just frankly wanted to sponsor research and be a good community partner. Um, and so, you know, we gave a chunk of money to fund a graduate student, and it's not a lot of money for industry to fund a graduate student. Uh, that allowed that graduate student to do a paper that I ended up collaborating with them on when I was on the Uber side. And, you know, in the end, both, you know, both places won. You know, they got funding, they got to do research, they got access to people at Uber. You know, we got access to people at Berkeley and got a recruiting pipeline going. We got good branding because we were uh, funding research at academia. You know, and everyone kind of got to do what they want. Um, I think a key um, part of the formula there is that we weren't trying to control the research a lot, you know, because research is uncertain, you know, and people kind of have different interests and things change over time. And if you're really trying to use it as a short term R&D, go solve this problem, or maybe not even R&D, but like literally like engineering, like go solve this problem. I think that that's not uh, a great model, unless those researchers are really committed to working with you to deploy something in that space, which may be in like healthcare deployment, that would be a motivation for somebody. Uh, so one, the one model that works quite well is um, fund it and forget it to use maybe not the most, um, not how I would brand it if I was seeking that funding, but I think that's reality. Uh, I think another thing that really has worked a lot is when industry has data that is valuable that academics don't have access to. And you can get a group of academics that wanna analyze, study and reveal what's in the data. And you have industry that has the data but doesn't have a publishing arm. It doesn't maybe have the funding or the, the, um, the mandate to stop and study that data a lot. So one um, place where I saw this work really well at Uber was Uber was trying to be a good community partner and show that it, you know, um, could optimize cities and maybe reduce, make cities more green and, and decrease traffic and decrease, you know, the stress in people's lives. And they revealed a lot of data about what, where people were going and when, et cetera. I don't know a lot of the details of it, but this massive data set is made available. And then, so, you know, Uber gets what it wants because it's being a good partner and it get, that gives it capital with local political officials and cities. And then the academics do what they want, which is a treasure source of data that they want to publish and they get to publish and that's pre-arranged. So the carpet's not going to get pulled out from under them halfway through. And then everybody's happy. And Uber, again, wasn't trying to control the outcome as far as I know. I wasn't part of that project uh, in terms of what's being released or whatever. And so both sides are happy. Uh, and then a final model that I've seen work quite well is, you know, very short initial consulting sessions where companies will come. This is kind of what Karen was saying. It, it happened maybe a little bit in her dream scenario. And I had this happen to me at Wyoming. Companies would come and say, here's what we are challenged. Here are our challenges. You know, what technologies are coming that provide opportunities within our company, within our sector? Or here's a particular problem. What technologies should we try or think about? Or where should we hire experts and consultants? And because we spend our lives immersed in the cutting edge, we know what's coming. We know all the you know, diversity of techniques. It doesn't take a lot, even though we're busy. It doesn't take a lot of our time to give you a lot of ideas for what you can go pursue. And then you go hire the people that are actually going to go do that work. I think that model works well, especially within something like Kaido, where you're a member of it and you get access to talk to the people that are 
part of that community. Um, and I think that, you know, the thing that is the hardest to do is when you're trying to really direct academics to do stuff. Um, because, you know, this isn't exactly what they need to do, what the pressure they're incentivized to do, both um, in terms of their internal structures and their passions. And that is delicate. And I would, you know, be very cautious if, I, if, if you were trying to pull off a model like that. Thanks. Um, I, uh, th there are things I'd be interested to ask each of you, but uh, I, I want to leave some ample time for questions here. I think uh, if panels always really give uh, um, it, it's really interesting to see how, how a diffuse audience reacts to uh, what they've just heard on a panel. So um, let me invite you, if you have something to say, just to turn on your video so we know you're there, or to uh, ask questions in the chat if, uh, if you prefer. Um, but I think, I think it's especially fun if, uh, if we hear from the audience directly. I'll give people just a moment to, uh, to formulate their thoughts if anyone's got anything they'd like to ask. Happy to fill the gap a little bit with uh, a mention of the federal budget. So there was talk about the super cluster and another 60 million. I have to say, uh, you heard from Prang earlier, that was a very successful project. So I encourage anyone, if they do get the funding through whichever of the, the super clusters, it's, I found it a good way, it's a huge amount of work. Um, uh, as Prang knows probably better than me, but uh, it was interesting to combine the, the small company with a large company, in our case, the health authority uh, to get things done. It was, uh, it was quite, a, quite a rewarding uh, exercise. Well, I'd love to hear from somebody in the audience, but uh, if we don't have any questions, I, I, there's more that uh, I, I'd be happy to ask. I, I guess I see Kevin um, Wang has raised a hand. Kevin, would you like to ask something? Uh, hello there, everyone. Uh, I, I had a question. Um, okay, so it was like really inspiring to listen to everyone talk about their projects and the knowledge they've gained from them and their experience. But as an undergraduate student, currently the path to reach that level seems a little bit hazy at the moment. So I was wondering if any of you had comments for how an under like certain undergraduate skills that a student may find useful to get like make some steps towards reaching that level. Thanks for the question, uh, Kevin. Um, let's uh, maybe give a couple of people on the panel a chance to respond and uh, have time maybe for another question. I can take a crack at that. So um, just a few things that come to mind, what to do as an undergrad, look for co-op opportunities in the research labs of the people whose research you want to get involved with. There's a number of subsidies uh, for those co-op positions. So that's a great way to be involved. I've also um, supervised a number of undergraduate thesis. Uh, depending on which, which department you're in, you can do an undergraduate thesis. And I've also really enjoyed supervising those students who go through that. Um, I've also had students that volunteer their time in my lab. And even with COVID, especially with work on, on AI, there's, there's lots of work, frankly, to be done. Everything from curation of data, training of algorithms, uh, processing results, uh, you know, working with our collaborators, lots of, lots of things that can be done from home, even during this time of COVID. Hey, Brad. Um, is there somebody else who'd like to uh, add to Rob's answer there? I'll just say that, you know, um, there's so many resources in addition to the ones that were just mentioned. Those are formal ways and those are great. But the, uh, yeah, when, nowadays with the internet, there are so many online resources for self-study and self-learning. Every academic paper is online. You can go read it. But those might be impenetrable at the beginning. So, like, you know, online MOOCs or tutorials and like things that walk you through uh, coding things up, studying things, reading things. Those are all fantastic. I know sometimes it can, those, you know, getting slots uh, to do undergrad research is very important, but there also can be a little bit hard. So like the volunteering things and also just self-study are also fantastic opportunities. So I just say, don't take no for an answer. Just, you know, voraciously study, read, whatever you're passionate about, throw yourself at it and just keep going and great things will happen. Uh, maybe for my part, Kevin, let me just add that uh, advice I had as an undergrad that I found really helpful was to focus more on the people that you would work with than exactly what the project would be. 
not to kind of pick exactly a topic that you wanted to work on and then seek out the one person at the university who does that, but really cultivate a relationship with somebody that you find intellectually fun and kind of simpatico to work with and go wherever that person takes you and let's see what you learn from the partnership. Um, anyway, thanks to the panelists for their answers. We have a, a question as well from uh, Sneha. I hope I'm saying that right. Yes, uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm also an undergrad and I've been reading a bit about like AI in the medical field. And I was just wondering, one thing I came across was that um, right now in the medical field, a lot of um, interactions with healthcare professionals tend to be kind of a depersonalized kind of brief. And that may sometimes lead to like misdiagnosis and like medical errors. So I was just wondering, um, we talked about how AI has like its own set of flaws. Um, but is there a way in which the like, personalized AI can help address this issue? And if so, how? Maybe I'll, uh... Yeah, this is a, a great question. And um, for sure, there is a, a lot of um, interest in having um, AI um, agents or techniques uh, complement um, you know, the human expertise. Um, well, the problem is that sometimes uh, what has been found, for instance, is that doctors are very busy, right? So um, there is the, that bottleneck they might, and they just kind of want to focus on the health issues and sometimes are lacking um, the time uh, to also engage in a little bit more empathic behaviors that uh, are important for patients that are, for instance, being given really bad news, right? So uh, one space of research um, that's quite fascinating is having um, AI uh, complement uh, these aspects by um, injecting that sort of, uh, you know, like in affective um, aspects in the interaction with patients that um, doctors might not uh, be able to do, which is actually quite uh, challenging because again, you know, having <laughs> uh, models of affective um, behaviors is, is difficult, but there are some interesting uh, projects and some very interesting results that uh, if you want, I, you know, I can follow up. If you want to send me an email, I can give you some pointers because that's definitely one aspect where AI has been seen as potential helpful, despite the fact that humans should be much better at emotional reactions, but sometimes time is the bottleneck, so. Well, we're trying to keep us uh, on time, so I think uh, let, let's uh, wrap up there. Th thanks uh, once again to all of the panelists and to everyone who uh, participated in the event today. Um, thanks uh, especially to uh, Aaron Keane, our research coordinator, and uh, Michael Vanderpan, uh, our deputy director, who put in the lion's share of the work in organizing this event. Um, and uh, I, uh, I think it's really inspiring to see um, the, the breadth and quality of uh, AI work at uh, UBC that uh, is happening really across the board. Um, let me tell you, when we were organizing this event, we probably could have organized two or three other versions of the event with entirely non-overlapping groups of people that would have been <laughs> equally high quality and compelling. We really have a a wealth of amazing work happening here at UBC uh, that uh, you know, we can just keep doing this for years to come. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's great to be part of this. Um, now it's the part in our schedule where we all go off to gather and little 8-bit avatar versions of ourselves talk with each other. <laughs> the way that, that is, uh, I invite you to do it because you know, isn't interpersonal connection with other actual human beings uh, a wonderful and lacking thing? Uh, particularly in these times. Uh, yeah, I think one theme we really got from this, uh, this panel and maybe from the talks as a whole is that you know, connections between people and you know, partnerships and collaborations are just such a critical part of how advancement in AI happens and how research gets done. So, so I hope we can uh, connect a bit with each other, have some informal conversations and uh, thanks, thanks for being a part of this event today. <laughs>